It's interesting just to study sometimes these, these prophets um, of old to examine the tasks that God had given to them and look at their who they were um, and why, to try to examine why God chose these individuals, to look at the task that they had, the conditions of the people that they were discussing things with, and make application to us, obviously. We can, we can learn a lot about who we need to be by learning what God appreciated in a person or a prophet of old. But we can also look at Amos' time and, and we can see some eerie parallels to the day and age we live in today. Amos prophesied during the last part of the reign of uh, Jeroboam the second, uh, and that would have been about uh, 750 B.C., uh, and it was shortly before Israel was to go into captivity uh, to Assyria. And it's interesting because uh, Amos was primarily a prophet to Judah, the, the southern tribes of Israel. Uh, Jeroboam reigned um, over Israel in a time like I said, just before the Assyrian captivity, and uh, some historians have referred to this referred to this period of time as Israel's Indian Summer. Um, Indian Summer is is sometimes a phrase we use to refer to a uh, a period of warm weather that's just before a period of real real cold weather. Uh, so it's kind of deceptive. You uh, you you have a period of warm weather and you think spring or summer but then there's this real big bitter cold snap. And historians kind of apply this time right before Assyrian captivity uh, to that, that this was a time that it seemed like Israel was fine and that everything was, uh, that there was nothing to fear, uh, but that was a decep deception. And so God sends uh, a Southern prophet to the Northern tribes uh, in an attempt to get Israel to repent uh, before the Assyrian captivity, uh, Israel was enjoying a, a lot of prosperity, uh, material gain. Uh, the people uh, probably thought that they had never had it as, so good. And thus the idea of that Indian summer that they felt like, hey, things are on their way up and things are only going get, to keep getting better and better. But in hindsight, we know that 20 or 25 years later, they were going to go into captivity and lose everything. And so it's important for us to, uh, to remember that, um, that we have to look at every uh, aspect of our life today as if, um, as if today is what we're living for, right? We have to prepare uh, for tomorrow, but we need to make sure that we don't judge tomorrow based on Today we have to do live every day uh, like our last. Really, is we have to live every day uh, doing what God would have us to do to be pleasing to God and never get to a point where we feel like we're at ease, because uh, Israel obviously deceived itself, and today people can deceive themselves as well and think that everything's okay uh, because of different signs you might say or or how well things are. Uh, Amos, uh, verse 1 of chapter 1, tells us uh, a little bit about who Amos was. Um, it says, The words of Amos, who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Josiah, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Uh, so uh, Amos was a, a, a herdsman. Um, in Amos chapter 7, uh, we're told a little bit more about his livelihood or what he did. Uh, verse 14, it says, Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy unto my people Israel. So he was a, a, a dresser of sycamore trees, a fruit gatherer, uh, a herdsman and a fruit gatherer. So he, uh, he was uh, well acquainted with nature and uh, both of the flock and of the tree. 
And uh, as I pointed out, he was from the south. He was from Judah. In uh, Amos chapter 7, verse 12, he says, uh, Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer of Judah, or uh, flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread and prophesy there. And that's interesting because uh, it could have easily been the case that God say, I've already sent the northern tribes the prophets they need, and if they're not going to listen to them, then let them, uh, let them be punished as, as, as things would happen and occur. But it's almost as if God was trying one last thing, right? I'll send someone from the south. I'll send a prophet from another land, and maybe they'll listen to someone else, someone from Judah. Of course, we know uh, hindsight they did not. But it tells us a lot about God and, and the efforts that he goes through to try to, make, to help people to give people opportunity. It also tells us a little bit about our role, right, in trying to help people. Um, we, uh, we need to be uh, concerned about not just people in our immediate vicinity, but people uh, who might be far from us. We need to have concern about their lives uh, as well as ours and those around us. It also tells us that the people of Israel should have received this man of Judah. Um, you know, we have to take into consideration what the person is saying. But if the person is saying the truth, whether he be from the south or the north or from the east or the west, we should accept a man of God as being a man of God. And it could be the case that some in Israel said, this man's from Judah, what's he doing up here? It's none of his business, right? All things are good up here. We're prosperous. Uh, they've never been better. Our future looks great. And now there's, there's this guy from Judah comes up here and tells us things aren't as good as they seem and, and things are, are bad and that we need to repent. And they could have sent him away, right? So that goes both ways. We, like Amos, need to be concerned about not just the things that are going around, around in our immediate vicinity, we need to be concerned about others and uh, those that might be in other areas, right? On the other hand, if someone come to us from another area or from, uh, uh, from someone we don't know, but if they're bringing the truth, if they're bringing the word of God, and as Charles brought up in his prayer, if what he is saying harmonizes with the will of God, we should accept it not because of who he is necessarily or where he came from, but because of it's true. In um, verse, let's see. The well, the whole book really deals with Amos trying to rem to tell Israel of a burden that they were about to go through and and be uh, amenable to. But this also was a burden to Amos, the one that had to share the bad news, right? So it was a burden for him. It was a burden of responsibility. And it was a burden in the sense that he was going to be rejected too because it was not good news. We see the condition of the people he was speaking to. And that kind of, as I said, is a pure, uh, eerie parallel to today. In Amos chapter 3, verse 15, the Bible says... I will smite the winter house with the summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall have an end, saith the Lord. Uh, the people obviously living pretty high on the hog, uh, as if there was nothing to, uh, nothing to fear, as if there was no bad about to happen, as if everything was great. Uh, ivory houses, right? Uh, summer houses, winter houses, multiple houses. It seems like the people were doing pretty well for themselves, right? And But the problem is they had forgotten God. And so in uh, Amos chapter 6, verse 1, he says, Woe to them that are, ease in, are at ease in Zion, and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. So God sends this woe, right? This warning. 
that there's nothing necessarily wrong to have a winter house and a summer house or houses built of ivory, but if you trust in yourself and you trust in the wicked nations around you to protect you and you ignore God and reject God, there, the uh, Amos, the southern prophet here says, you need to be aware of this. You need to be warned of this. Uh, if you place your trust in, in material goods or in, or in wicked, evil people, you're, uh, you're doomed to fail eventually. And so it says, uh, verse 2, Pass ye unto Calne, and see, and from thence go to Hamath, the great, then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Be they better than these kingdoms? Or their border greater than your border? Ye that put far away the evil day and cause the seed of violence to come near, that lie upon beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall, that, that chant to the sound of the vial and invent to themselves instruments of music like David, that drink wine and bowls and anoint themselves with the chief ointments, but they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph." So they're going about life as normal, but their normal life was pretty good. Singing, uh, feasts, eating, drinking, partying, enjoying life, uh, enjoying the best things of life, right? We see here, uh, they're happy, they're eating lamb, they're, they, uh, uh, but all things aren't as they appeared, were they? And he appeals here, they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Um, if you'll remember, uh, many times the, the Bible refers back to, uh, to Joseph and how he was faithful to God and that there would be generations who would forget him or forget about that connection between Joseph and God and that faithfulness. And how Joseph had a family that could have been at ease and had had everything, and his brothers did, but they turned on him, right? And uh, he had to deal with a great deal of affliction from them. And so, uh, though Joseph uh, was of a good family, right, generally speaking, uh, this thing turned bad for him. And so God, the, through the prophet, is trying to warn them that you need to not be at ease or think that all things are going to be well. And ultimately they had forgotten Joseph, but they had also forgotten uh, the affliction that Joseph dealt with and they had forgotten God. In Amos chapter 2, Verse 6, it says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, and that phrase is used several times throughout Amos. Um, I think it starts in verse 3 of chapter 1, for three transgressions and four, chapter 2, verse 1, for three transgressions of Moab and for four, and of course he's dealing with different nations there. But he, he, he ultimately gets to Israel for three transgressions and four, and it seems like the idea is that Israel was uh, building up a bad reputation, but eventually those transgressions were going to reap a punishment, that, they were not, that God was not going to tolerate them very long. And he gives them examples of where it looked like Moab was doing just fine, and then they were punished. Uh, Damascus was doing just fine, and they'll be punished, right? And so uh, the same would happen to Israel. So verse uh, 6, he says, for three transgressions of Israel and for four. And it's interesting that he puts them in the same category as these other nations. I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes uh, that pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor and turn aside the way of the meek. And a man and his father will go in into the same maid to profane my holy name. And they lay themselves down upon clothes laid to pledge by every altar, and they drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. And so they had uh, begun, the, the society was a wicked society, I think it's fair to say. They had, uh, they had obviously turned away from God's will. They were not treating one another as they ought. They were uh, oppressing 
the poor. Uh, they, were, uh, they were very lascivious. They were um, uh, obscene in a lot of things. And uh, they obviously had followed after idolatry. And so the societal uh, decline of their morals, and they were morally depraved. Uh, there was a great deal of corruption. How is it that a, that a people that had known God and had learned of Abraham and Joseph and those fathers, David is even mentioned when, they talk, when God mentions the music, those individuals who knew of them, how could they think that they could live a life like this and, and get away with it and think that it's ple either think that it's pleasing to God or that God would wink at it or not care about it? And of course, uh, their religious apostasy continued at Amos chapter 5, verse 21. I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. But let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. So it might be the case that people today say, well, we're not as wicked as those people. I mean, they were totally morally depraved. They were corrupt, they were cheating, they were stealing. But then we see not only were they morally depraved, they were spiritually depraved. Um, they, they were worshiping idols, they were worshiping in a lascivious way. But here God says to them, you offer, even those of you who are offering worship, uh, offering animal sacrifices, uh, verse 21, he says, I hate them. I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. And, of course, we go back to the law of Moses, where in the temple uh, there was supposed to be the burning of incense, and it would be presented in a golden um, plate that would be set before the curtain of the most holy place. And the Bible refers to that smoke as a sweet-smelling savor to God. And uh, the New Testament applies that to prayer for us today, that it's a sweet-smelling savor. All of that, though, had to be done in accordance with God's will for God to accept it, number one. And number two, it had to be, in order for it to be accepted, it had to come from someone who was clean, right? So those individuals who could present that smoke before the Lord, first, before they could even come into the tabernacle, had to wash in the brazen laver. They had to get clean. That was a ceremonial cleansing. But the idea was that they needed to be right with God. They needed to be clean, not stained with sin. And so if you come before God to worship, even if you're offering the right thing, God says, if your life's not right, if you're a wicked person, a corrupt person, I'm not going to accept your worship. And that says a lot today to today's uh, worship or religious uh, ideas that just because you offer something to God doesn't mean he will accept it. Right? We have to have a life that is conducive to bringing forth uh, what God would be pleased with, what he will smell. And so it's talking about worship. It's talking about their spirituality. But because of their lives, their lives had made their worship unacceptable. Most likely because if you forget God and how you're supposed to live your life Monday through Friday, let's say, just to put it in context, then most likely you're not going to be living, you're not going to be worshiping the way God wants you to worship on Sunday either, right? And of course, that's a New Testament kind of picture of what we're seeing in Amos. Uh, but they were living a life that was not in harmony with what God would want with a person who would truly come before God with a proper attitude and a proper spiritual sacrifice. And so they continued to uh, fall away from God and get worse and worse. We also see in uh, Amos chapter 5, verse 18, that part of their problem was their, they trusted in themselves, right? They had become a prideful, arrogant people. Uh, it says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. 
To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. And so they had become a, a very proudful people. Look at verse 19. As if a man did flee from a lion and, bear met, and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him, shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? So the people of Israel had gotten to the point where they felt like they were invincible. They were not vulnerable in any way, did they think? Uh, even though they were doing things that were totally against God's will, even in, in their in their day-to-day -day life and in their religious life, in their spiritual life. And then, of course, uh, Amos says, you know, after all these woes and after the condition that we see them in, obviously uh, Amos warns them. He encourages them to correct and to repent. Uh, but then he says, if you don't, there is a consequence. And, of course, uh, there's always consequence to sin. Amos chapter 7, verse 7 uh, thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, I, a plumb line. Then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them any more. And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. And so God says to Amos, he shows him a plumb line, which is a, uh, a line that would show whether something is straight and level. And if they were, uh, so a, a standard, right? Something by which we can uh, judge whether something is right. Is it level? Is it straight? Is it correct? And he says, I'm going to lay this plumb line down in Israel, and I'm going to compare what they're doing with my plumb line, right? with my ruler or my yardstick, my, my measuring device. So God has a standard of what is right. God has a standard of what is correct. And it's not up to God to change his way to, to suit our purposes, but for Israel in this case and us today to harmonize ourselves or straighten our lives out according to this plumb line. But if we don't, if we don't measure up Right? If we're not in line with the plumb line, if we're not, uh, if we're not parallel with the plumb line, uh, God says he will bring down justice. He will bring down judgment. All of those, all of those uh, evil deeds that were being done, whether it be done, done during the week, they were going to be torn down. All those evil things that were being done and called worship, they would be brought down. And, uh, and he says, I will, I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. And obviously a prophetic reference to the fact that Israel was going to be destroyed uh, and taken in captivity by a heathen nation, a heathen army by the sword. Uh, and then we read of the uh, Amos 8 chapter, or chapter 8, another analogy. So we have the plumb line. And then we have another analogy in Amos 8 of summer fruit. Uh, verse 1, it says, Thus hath the Lord showed unto me, and beheld a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, The, the end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them any more. And the songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day, saith the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies in every place. They shall cast them forth with silence. Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fall or fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn and the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great and falsifying the balances by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes, Yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. And so, uh, here another picture of how Israel was uh, ripe for the taking, if you will. Their time had come. Uh, they were about to be plucked. And it was because of their evil deeds. And 
God through Amos uh, enumerates these for Israel so that they wouldn't get a misunderstanding, right? He was very specific in what he was talking about and the people of Israel would have uh, been easily able to understand the con- what they were doing was seen by God and that, uh, that there were consequences for it. It's also interesting that uh, in Amos chapter 4, God through Amos tells the people that the only way to change this future, okay, they thought their future was good and great, right, and uh, prosperous based upon what they beheld in front of them. Right? They were living an e- a life of ease in Zion as if nothing was wrong. And so they thought that was their future. But Amos is telling them a very different picture. Uh, he, he tells them that what God sees is not pretty at all. And he tells them that, the, that, the, that their destruction is at hand. So God has a totally different picture of what's about to happen and what is happening to those of Israel. And the only way to change this future that Amos is telling them about, is to change what they're doing right then. The only way to change the, cons- the consequences or to change the judgment is to change what we're doing right now. Okay, so that's why Amos was sent in the first place, right? You need to change what you're doing right now, he said to Israel, or what I'm, about, what I'm telling you will not change. So uh, he says this in chapter 4, beginning verse 6. He says, I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and want of bread in all your places, yet have you not returned unto me, saith the Lord. And also I have withholden the rain from you when there were yet three months to the harvest and I caused it to rain upon one city and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon and the piece whereupon it rained not withered. So two or three cities wandered into one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased. The palmer worm devoured them, yet have ye not returned unto me. I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Yet your young men have I taken Or have I slain with the sword and have taken away your horses and I have made the stink of your camps to come up unto your nostrils, yet have you not returned unto me? I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and you were a firebrand plucked out of the burning, yet have you not returned unto me? Therefore thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Now, (laughs) We sing a song, Prepare to Meet Thy God. And uh, we hopefully sing it with a very hopeful mindset, right? (laughs) Doing what we need to do to be right so that we are prepared to meet God, and that will be a great day. But uh, this is a very ominous prepare to meet thy God, isn't it? Because God says, how often have I tried to turn you from your evil ways so that you would be ready to meet me? And he tells them of many ways of how he tried. But their obstinance, uh, perhaps again their arrogance, uh, their their hateful rejection of, of God's word and his prophets. And over and over again he reminds them, you would not return unto me. And so God's long suffering, but eventually long suffering runs out. Long suffering means suffering long, but not suffering forever, right? (laughs) So God is long suffering. He wants all these people to be right. And that's the reason he sent all these things to turn them from their way, even men like Amos. But if they don't turn, then there was nothing to save them. In the New Testament, the Bible tells us if we reject the Christ, if we turn away from the, the law of Christ unto another law or or to the Jewish, uh, to the Christians who had just come out of Judaism, if they were to go back into Judaism, uh, the New Testament tells us that there was no more sacrifice for sin. If you reject the Christ, there's nothing else that can save you. There's nothing left. 
And so if you don't repent today, then the consequences of the future are certain. In uh, Amos chapter 3, verse 11, he tells us uh, that not only would that judgment and that consequence be certain, it would be severe. In other words, it was worthwhile for them to listen to Amos. <laughs> it wasn't going to be a slap on the wrist, right? Chapter 3, verse 11 he says, Therefore, saith, uh, thus saith the Lord God, an adversary there shall be even round about the land, and he shall bring down thy strength from thee, and thy palaces shall be spoiled. Thus saith the Lord, as the shepherd taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out that dwell in Samaria in the corner of a bed, and in Damascus in a couch. And uh, chapter 4, verse 2 says, The Lord God has sworn by his holiness that lo, the day shall come upon you, that you will take you away with hooks and your posterity with fish hooks. The, this punishment was going to be severe. They were going to be taken into captivity. Many of them would die, and then many of them would die in captivity. And we don't read of any Israelites from the northern tribe coming back to Jerusalem. If there were, we're just not told about it. But we read of the, the returns that happened from Babylonian captivity in the, in the tribes of Judah. And another, um, I suppose, similarity to this judgment that if they didn't repent in the day that they had opportunity, the consequences were going to be unchangeable, they would be severe, but Amos says it would come in a day when they would not know about it. Well, they weren't ready when Amos came, were they? They were living it up as if nothing was wrong, living a horrible, wicked life, uh, not worshiping God as they ought, worshiping as they wanted, offering God what they wanted, uh, doing things uh, in in a in a ungodly manner, really, offering God ungodliness, and. If they did not repent, they were going to be lost. And the consequences for that was going to be severe and it would come in a day when they were not ready. Similar to what we read in the New Testament that the, that the Christ, the return of the Christ would come as a thief in the night when everything's just going about as normal, right? It's, it's going to be a day that we're not expecting. Uh, Amos uh, 5 verse 27 Amos says, therefore will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Uh, chapter 6, verse 3, ye that put far away the evil day and cause the seed of violence to come near. Ye that put far away the evil day. Most of the people were probably looking at Amos saying, that's silliness, that's foolishness, we're God's people. <laughs> He's going to let a heathen nation like the Assyrians take over his called people. And so they were putting off the evil day. Some of them probably put it off altogether and said it's not going to happen. And others said, well, it might happen, but it's not going to happen during my lifetime. Uh, Amos chapter 9, verse 10. It says, All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. Obviously, those individuals who said these things continued to do what they were doing, continued to laugh at Amos and the other prophets, continued to spit in the face of God. And the Bible says they would still be there when Assyria came marching through and they would be the ones that would die by the sword. One of the reasons they would be there to die by the sword is they continued to get closer and closer to heathen nations like Assyria and farther and farther away from God. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Some people want to get closer and closer and closer to the things of this world. And in doing so, they start leaving God behind. Well, that's what Israel did. And that's what Amos is telling them about. If you get closer and closer to Assyria or closer and closer to the world, you're going to be farther and farther away from God. 
you're going to be closer and closer to, notice what he says, uh, all the sinners um, of my people shall, all the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. And 6 verse 3 says, Ye that put far away the evil day and cause the seed of violence to come near. Right? All that's so far off, but you're actually bringing it closer to you. They had never, at this time, bothered with trying to disassociate from those heathen nations. They thought they were securing themselves by joining with heathen nations who had powerful militaries and forgot that God said, you don't need these armies, you've got me. <laughs> but Amos warns them that uh, they would go into captivity and they would go into captivity to the ones they trusted. <laughs> Had they trusted God, they would have remained close to God. They would have done godly things the way God wants them to do, and God would have protected them. But they left God, and they, they planted their roots near Damascus in Assyria, these heathen nations, and it was the very people they trusted who took them over. We've just kind of looked at a few aspects of the book of Amos is a wonderful book. But just looking at you know the, who Amos was and the conditions he faced, we see that we need to be like Amos because we live in a similar world. <laughs> and the message that we need to have to our fellow man is similar to what Amos preached to Israel. You know, now is the time to take care of your problems. Now is the time to repent. Now is the time to get right with God. And it might seem like the judgment is far off. But it might be closer than we see. But then we know. But nonetheless, the judgment is unchangeable if we don't change. And it is severe. And it it will come upon us like a thief in the night. And so we need to be prepared. We need to do what we can today to be right with God. And that's what Amos was preaching. It's interesting, I, I read somewhere where Amos, they said Amos was a preacher who preached it is never too soon to repent. You know, generally we would think it's never too late to repent. And I think that's kind of what Amos was saying. But it can be too late to repent. Right, It can be too late to repent because if the judgment comes, it's too late to repent. It's never too soon to repent because the sooner the better. <laughs> we don't want to wait till it's too late. We don't, want, we don't know when too late is. And so we, we see the people around us and we try to be the example that we ought to be to to, as we talked about in our Bible class, to preach the sermon that we need by our example. But we also need to uh, use every opportunity we can to teach people about the good news that today is the day that people can change and make things right with God. And we do that not just to avoid the consequences of sin and not just to avoid the judgment that is sure to those who do not repent, but because of how blessed it is to be a child of God. <laughs> how blessed it is to be a child of God. To have a relationship with God as if you're a child to a father. To have the fellowship of other faithful individuals as if it's a family, brothers and sisters in Christ. To have that association where we have the help and the assistance that we need in times of trouble. The, the time when we are happy and can enjoy life together because we 
uh, are in the same mind and in the same judgment, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. We believe the same things and we are faithful to the same things. To know that Jesus loved us enough and gave, uh, gave himself and shed his own blood for us. To have the security and the peace of mind that I did what I needed to do to get that blood to wash away my sin. And therefore I have hope. Yes, we need to repent. We need to turn away from our wicked ways and, and we need to share that with the world so that they can avoid the consequences, the judgment, but we also need to share with them the blessings. There's no better blessing than to be in Christ. One can be in Christ today if he'll hear the word, believe it, repent of his past sins, confess that Jesus is the Christ and be baptized in water to have the forgiveness of sins. And then from that point on, when the Lord adds him to the church, Acts 2 verse 47, he is a faithful child of God and continues to be faithful the rest of his days. And if as a child of God we stumble, uh, the Bible tells us that we have the opportunity to ask God to forgive us and turn away from sin. And, and the blood of Jesus continues to wash us in that blood, uh, away from sin, or washes our sin away. And so if you've not obeyed the gospel, the invitation is extended. Uh, if you have any need that we can help you with, come now.